title of my talk is Present Time in Humans, Insights from Brain and Cognition. And uh, when we uh, talk about present time, we have to take into account that uh, it, the present, the definition depends on the level of description and analysis. I'll give you uh, some examples here. For example, in uh, brain research, if we talk about present time in the activity of those contacts between nerve cells, which we call synaptic, synaptic contacts, then we usually refer to uh, one millisecond. Of course, not of great interest to most people here, but essentially of extreme importance, because if it doesn't work at the present time, then we cannot understand what other people say or what our own thought. Bre present time in terms of a circuit in the brain, which means a collection or a population of uh, nerve cells acting together, is the order of magnitude of over 10 milliseconds. I'm not accurate here because, A, it's impossible to be accurate. There is a reason why I wrote here 10 milliseconds, uh, but uh, over uh, more than 10 milliseconds, but you can take it as an order of magnitude. Present time in perceptual and cognitive domains, I wrote here over 30 milliseconds. Again, there are reasons to write it like that, but if uh, Ayelet or somebody else would come and say, no, it's 20 or 40 or 50, that's fine with me. Uh, because in uh, uh, in physics, for example, uh, people would say uh, it's uh, 10 when it's 8 or 12. It's an order of magnitude. Behavioral present uh, is the order of magnitude of seconds. Social present, order of magnitude of minutes to hours and more. And generational present, we are going to talk about years. Now, what I would like to focus on today is perceptual cognitive and behavioral present. So if we focus our attention, these are the domains in time that we are going to discuss. In addition to that, one additional definition or sort of remark, since I uh, talk from the point of view of an investigator that researches memory, I would like to give a very brief definition. Memory are, for me, internal representations of past information which is either stored or can be reconstructed. So the important point here is that we are talking about recreation or reactivation of past information. This is very important, as we will see in a few minutes. So most experiences in life unfold over time. So unless it's something that occurs within a fraction of a second, usually in order to comprehend what we experience, we need some narrative that will explain it to us, and it is formed on the fly. And my question is, what is the nature of present time in these experiences, and what is the duration of the elemental experience? And when we talk about present time, I would like to take the opportunity to uh, cite Augustine. Uh, perhaps it would be exact to say there are three times, a present of things past, a present of things present, and a present of things to come. And uh, it's extremely important to pay attention to the fact this is exactly how we see it in modern uh, neuroscience of memory or neurocognition of memory. We regard the memory of experience, or as we call it in our uh, discipline, episodic memory as mental time to the past. So it's something that we do at the present and travel to the past. And it shares, it is a shared faculty. In fact, it shares brain structures with imagining, with mental time travel to the future. So here you have a sort of a modern view of the exact things that Augustine said at the fourth century. AD. And the, the present considering the past is the memory. The present considering the present is immediate awareness, and the present considering the future is expectation. So it's mental time present to the past, mental time present to the future, and something that we experience at present. And my question is, what is this that we experience at present? So a question could be also asked in the following way. Is present time discrete or continuous? 
I'll explain that. And what is the operational or sense duration of the elemental of present time? Please remember, we are talking here about the neurocognitive domain. So we are talking about a duration that is expected to be something between fractions of a second to a few seconds, which is intuitively understood because in, uh, in introspective psychology, if you think about the present, this is usually what you think in, in terms of a seconds, a few seconds, not minutes or hours, and not fractions of a second because uh, it's uh, almost impossible in routine life to uh, appreciate that. So I would like to, uh, by way of uh, uh, completing this introduction, uh, to uh, remind you of two uh, notions. One of them, uh, that there are various hypotheses considering how the present is constructed. And two of the major ones in neurocognition and philosophy as in some uh, facet of philosophy as well, are the discrete moment hypothesis versus the traveling moment, moment hypothesis. Discrete moment means that there is summation of chunks of present into a perceivable pressure, a, a present. And the traveling moment means that a continuous rolling sample of the input, or in some cases, people would say there is a rolling uh, average uh, of, of the input. And second, it's probably familiar to all of you because Cronoy is uh, uh, dealing with time. Uh, the two uh, classical theories of time, the general theories, they have many variants. The A theory of time or the A series that the present is privileged from the past and future and properties of being past, present and future are fundamental to the nature of time. And the B theory of time, they stem from over uh, in, in modern quote unquote thought, they stem from the early uh, 20th century that the present is not metaphysically privileged over past and future, and events can be ordered according to the different series of temporal positions by way of two-term relations. Uh, there is earlier than, later than, and in the middle, the present. And in uh, neuroscience, usually we refer to uh, our models, if we try to uh, construe them in terms of such theories, or such models as a theories, because we consider the, especially in memory research, the, the past and the future as being privileged from the present and from the each from each other. And this is correct, especially when we consider what we call episodic memory, the memory of events in our life, of experienced events in our life, but it does not hold when we talk about some aspects of memory that we call semantic memory. If you consider re recalling your past in such a way that you do not really reconstruct the past, but think about events, sometimes you consider it in terms of a equivalent events that one occurred earlier than or later than the other. We may refer to it again much later toward the end of, our, uh, of, of this presentation. It's interesting to note that uh, the uh, attempts to uh, define what is a, a, I'm trying to overcome here something that you don't see on my screen, I'll try to do that, uh, attempts to determine or estimate the duration of the present were made by various disciplines and in, in various periods. And some of you may uh, be engaged in that. I would like to bring something which is uh, really amazing for me. Uh, I'm that, that uh, some of you are familiar with it, especially Menachem. And uh, there is a beautiful um, a statement in the Talmud uh, that tries to define what is perceptual moment, what is the present moment. And I'll take the liberty of reading this sentence, only the one marked here in yellow in Hebrew, uh, and then try to translate it, because I think it's essential for understanding the wisdom that is inherent in it and the, and, and the surprising uh, conclusion. So in Hebrew, kamahu arega, what is, how much is a minute? Rabbi Brachia b'shem Rabbi Chalvo Amar, Rabbi Brachia said in the name of another rabbi, kedei le'omro, which means in translation, 
The time in, in Hebrew moment is rega. This is the word. So he said the duration of rega is the time it takes to utter the word rega. So rega is sort of honor to fair. It's something that is, includes in itself the duration of what it refers to. Rabbanan Amrin, uh, other rabbis said, Arega keheref ein. They said the moment is the eye blink, the duration of an eye blink, which is, by the way, probably correct. Tani Shmuel uh, said uh, uh, Shmuel, Arega, and this is the most amazing for me, Arega, Echad Mechameshet Ribo, Vesheshet Alafim, Veshmon Mot, Varbain Veshmon El Shah. Which is translated to the time in the time of the present is one over fifty six thousand eight hundred forty eight of an hour, which is sixty milliseconds. Now, if I here knows how did uh, Rabbi Shmuel uh, got to this calculation, I would much appreciate it. It's amazing for me. And it's not different from modern calculations, what is time present in terms of cognitive experience. So this is amazing. There are lots of uh, attempts to determine uh, the duration of perceptual moments uh, using much more modern and explainable and detailed uh, methodologies. I just wrote one example, which is a, a beautiful example. I'm not going to go into the technical details, just to give you the idea. This is work done, in fact, to understand what is the information that is encoded in the brain uh, in the process of a conscious momentary awareness. And what they did was uh, very basically they measured uh, 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 brain waves, electroencephalograms, you probably familiar with the term EEG, and they present the uh, subjects with a famous painting by Salvador Dali, you probably are familiar with that painting, which is called uh, The Slave Market and the Bust of Voltaire. And if you presented the, the, this part of the picture in, in black and white, and if you look at the picture, you can see here either a group of nuns or the bust of Voltaire. And what they did was to measure, without going into the details, uh, what is the optimal time, minimal time, in which you see one of them as separated from the other. And their uh, conclusion was that if you uh, analyze their conclusion, because they don't say it explicitly, because they were more interested in, in the content in terms of brain waves and brain construct, is between 150 and 30, 300 milliseconds. So there are many methods now that try to correlate uh, uh, brain waves with the conscious awareness of a momentary experience. However, I come to the issue, and that's the story I wish to tell you in, the, in, the, in that part of the talk, uh, till the end. Uh, what is present time in terms of episodic experience? Our experience, the experiences in our life that later become our memories, our episodic memories. What is the elementary present time in episodic experience? So we come back to that cartoon, and the cartoon tells us that there is a present here, there is past and the future. We don't expect the present in that case to be a sort of what we call a step function of a millisecond. We uh, expect it to unfold over time. I can give you a simple example. Suppose we approach the Cronoi Villa and from far away you see uh, uh, somebody, you don't at first recognize that person, but when you approach, you recognize that person. If you don't recognize the person or you recognize the person, the event makes a very different, um, a, a acquires a very different meaning to you and also will influence the way it goes into memory because most of the people that you encounter that are unfamiliar to you will not be remembered. And uh, people that are familiar to you will probably be remembered. So the experience unfolds over time and usually it takes a few seconds. I'm trying 
to overcome some issues here. In so the working hypothesis is the following. I apologize in advance in, if there are some technical issues in switching the slides. Uh, so a uh, working hypothesis, the memory of a realistic experience is commonly constructed from ephemeral segments of cognitive present time that are integrated over seconds before they enter a consolidation phase. I'll explain what is the consolidation phase, what is a consolidation phase in memory research. We experience consolidation every minute in our life. I hope you process the information in a consolidation mode right now, because in that case, you will remember something. But in order to do that, I have to remind you what is the biography of an item in memory. And then I will try to lead you through a simple experiment. You don't have to go into the technical details. It's important to understand the concept and some of the results uh, in order to try to explain how the brain does that, which means what happens in your brain and in your cognitive states when you experience an unfolding event, which is brief, a brief event. So the biography of an item in memory, in order to understand that or to refresh our uh, uh, view on that, what we have here is memory, which can be in various uh, units. So let's say this is the strength of the memory, but it's of course a very schematic. And this is time and time here is not linear. And uh, the first phase is that you acquire the information and then the information goes into short-term memory. We call it STM, short-term memory. We, we like acronyms. And then it will probably go in some cases, not in all cases, into long-term memory. And then the memory may be retrieved. This is a high simplification. And we used to say that the memory is stored here. Of course, we do not refer to storage here as something that is static. Storage is very dynamic. And there is one, and if you approach a person, a lay person, they would immediately find out if you ask them to describe the biography of an item in memory, they will say, yes, we acquire a memory. Usually they say we learn. We have short term and long term. We know it ourselves we, from our own experience. We can retrieve the memory and memory is stored. This is common knowledge. And the only difference is that we use a bit more complicated uh, uh, explanations and maybe other terms. The only phase which is not usually uh, uh, contained in a lay discussion of memory, when I say here lay, it's also very educated academics that don't deal with memory, is the consolidation phase. And consolidation is the phase where the short term is converted into long term, it's sort of maturation. So every memory, in order, almost every memory, in order to be transformed from short into long has to be consolidated. Consolidation may take minutes, seconds, minutes, and it depends. Sometimes we take, it will uh, endure for weeks, but we are not going to discuss that. For us, it's important to understand that there is a process that takes the acquired information and converts it into something which is persistent for a much longer time than the experience itself, because memory is recreation or a retrieval of information that is now offline. It's not online anymore. So having said that, I would like to present here a simple diagram. Don't be uh, alarmed by the fact that there are many terms because it's extremely simple. This is time here. That's the error of time. This is the phase of encoding. It's not linear, of course. This is the phase of encoding the information where the episode is on the fly. The episode is unfolding. Now the episode goes offline. The minute it goes offline, it, there is a transition into bona fide memory because, as I said, information that's not really already anymore on, of, uh, online, it's now offline, is information that is in memory provided you can retrieve it, activate it. Then there is this consolidation phase, and after some time, it depends on the process, it depends on the type of memory, it goes into long-term memory. So the model or the hypothesis we wish to test is whether 
It's only the information of the episode on the fly that usually will take seconds <clears throat> that is important for creation of the memory, or there are also influences of something that happens before and something that happens immediately after the encoding. And this is important to understand because if it's something that happens before, this means that our memories will be formed based on our previous experience before we encountered the experience that we want here to remember. And if memory occurs afterwards, it means that something else in addition to the experience will be intermingled into the information. It's extremely important. As you'll see later, it has some very pragmatical effect on our use of memory in daily life. But I'll keep this as a secret or as a mystery until the last slide. Why is it important? You can consider yourself, but I'll provide you with the solution immediately after, uh, toward the end of the talk. But here again, if information before the episode is important or determines in some way or another whether the episode will be remembered in memory, this means that it's not only the information here that determines whether we remember. Our past experience will determine whether we remember something that happens in the present. And if information after the episode <coughs> goes offline is important, plays a role, in the consolidation, in the storage, in the registration of the memory. This means that it's, not, again, it's not only the information of the episode that goes into what we remember. So I gave, I think, a sort of a heavy hint what's going to happen later. So I wish to introduce you to something which uh, we use in our lab. You don't have to be a neuroscientist. You have, don't have to be a neurobiologist. You don't have to be a brain researcher. You don't even have to be a biologist or a physicist in order to follow this simple procedure. We wish to understand, it's just logic. We wish to understand, we wish to identify which brain substrates of memory in human encode memory. How do we do that? This is a general protocol. It does not refer only to what I'm going to describe here. It's a general protocol and it's something that is pretty simple. Well, it's not so simple to do it, but it's pretty simple in the logic. So we divide our experiment into two sessions. One of them is we call the study session or the learning session. This is the session where we present you in the lab or if you wish in real life with the information that we wish to test whether you remember. So for example, you can, here use a text, you can here use a, a, a movie, a video, a, you can here use a, a auditory information, visual information, taste information, olfactory information, whatever you wish to use as the study material. We also call it in our profession, in our trade, we call it the memorandum, something that we wish people to remember. We don't know whether they remember, we have to test. And we do it in this type of experiment because we wish to study brain substrates. We do it in a scanner. And the scanner is a scanner which is an MRI, magnetic resonance imaging scanner. And the only thing that we have to know is that this scanner, without going into the details, which are also very easily explainable, that that scanner can determine, can measure, can quantify to some degree or another the activity in parts of your brain, it depends on the properties of that scanner, without invading your brain. This is extremely important because we don't want to use the brains of ourselves, of our colleagues and our students only once. We want not to invade them. We want to do it in a way which is not, in, 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 not invasive. And the introduction of this kind of machine, this kind of instrument enabled a revolution in brain research to some degree at a certain level of analysis, only at a certain level of analysis and resolution, it allows me, when I say me is the field, to see the brain active when the brain does something. And for Ayelet and others that are in the field, I would immediately say, yes, it's not directly the nervous, the neural activity, it's something related to it, but it's not important for us now. Now, after doing the study, I pay the volunteers their fees because volunteers, if they are students, not if they are faculty, get something like 50 shekels an hour. And that's why they want to volunteer. 
and they usually don't know exactly what is it that they are going to be tested on. And they go home or they go to the lab or go to a movie or whatever. And after some time, which may, if they can go home, if it's over hours, sometimes it's after three weeks, sometimes it's after three months, and sometimes it's after 20 minutes, we call them back. We call them back and now we test them for the memory of what they have encountered in the material they have encountered in the study session. And aptly so, we call it a test session. How do we measure? It doesn't matter for our purpose. We measure, we do, because we can measure it in various ways. But we measure memory performance. For example, I can ask you, uh, do you, here are four possibilities. Which one is correct regarding the material that you have seen or heard? So we test the memory after a time. So we have a study session and a test session. But now come the tri comes the trick. And that's the only thing I wish you really to pay attention in this slide. Here is what we do. We take the performance, we measure it. Again, doesn't matter exactly how we measure it. We have a memory performance unit here, okay? Some level of success. We go back to the activity of the brain that we have recorded in the study session. It's recorded, it's, 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 it's retained, okay? And we try to correlate activity or signatures of the brain with the memory performance much later. And by doing so, we look back for brain correlates of subsequent performance. By doing so, we try to identify the signatures here that predict the memory here. I hope this is understood. I saw only a few of you. So uh, let's say, Yosef, you raise your hand if it's utterly not understandable, and you raise the other hand and you decide which hand if it's understood. We go from the study to the test. We test the memory performance, which is behavior. We go back to our rec records of brain activity here, and we say, we can correlate performance, whether we remember or forgot here with performance here. And we try to identify the correlates, the signatures of the brain, the activity patterns of the brain that seem to predict, if we are here, the performance here. Okay? If there are questions here, please ask me. Feel free. If not, I'll, I'll construe that as understood. That's correct? Okay, it's really simple. Study, test. Go back when you have the performance here to the study session, look at your records and try to identify which activity in which parts of the brain and what time predicted that this will happen. It's not really prediction because when we were here, we didn't predict that we'll perform, but we can now look back and say, it sort of predicts the memory. This allows us to identify the circuits in the brain and their interactions when they are active in such a way that we lead to memory performance later. And I'll show you how it's done in a simple experiment without going, of course, into the technical details. Please feel free to ask questions, to say we don't understand it, that's fine. Uh, or can you please explain that and that? Don't feel like. Uh, don't be ashamed. So if we do these kind of things, the question is how do we study whether there is signatures not only or activities in the brain, not only during the episode, but also before the episode and after the episode that are important for subsequent memory. The protocol is called subsequent memory. It's an old protocol, old in science, is here, it's from the 70s, before these scanners were even invented. So how do we do that? If we just present you, for example, well, first of all, we have to do, to, to use material for study, which resembles very much a daily life experiences. This is not easy because we have to place the subjects in a scanner. <clears throat> they are not allowed to move, because if they move it, the, 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 the activities are not activities of what we want to see, but activities related to the movement or what they do, or they cannot speak, they cannot uh, move their hands, the legs, the head, and so on and so on. 
they have to be really silent, very difficult in Israel, but we, therefore we don't pay 30 shekel, we pay 50 shekel. There is a motivation to stay silent there. And most of our experiments are destroyed if people within the hour of an experiment feel the urge to go outside to the, to the restroom. That uh, immediately kills the experiments. So you have to sit there to lay there for, for to, to lie there for, 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 let's say, an hour. Now, if we, this immediately uh, prohibits using real life experiments because we cannot just place you in a room and say, look what happens, and then uh, because you are not in the scanner. So what we do, we mimic real life, experiment, real life experiences with uh, short clips of movies, narrative movies. These are the most popular, uh, and I'm happy to say that I belong to a team that uh, introduced this in, in neuroscience already in early 2000, together with Uri Hasson, uh, who is now in, professor in Princeton, and Laila Vavachi at NYU. Uh, what you do, you present in the scanner the people with a, nar with a short or long clips of narrative movies, and usually, or almost, of, almost always, movies they haven't seen before. So you have to either generate movies, which we did for a while, or collect them. And those are not movies that you see in a the theater. I'll show you a brief one in a second. The, the movies are very brief. So what do you do? If you present a long movie, it's impossible to dissociate the activity of the brain along various parts of the movie. Because whenever you detect something in the brain, you don't know whether it refers to something that happens a few seconds ago, a few minutes ago, and what happens to the brain immediately after you experience something, because the, everything, the experience is continuous. So the trick is very simple. We use very short movies, movie clips, between 4 and 12 seconds. If you use more than that, that's something that I don't want to go into now. Immediately after the clip, immediately after you see the movie, by the way, you, li you lie in the, in the scanner, you see it in a mirror in front of you. You don't have to, it's, it's uh, projected on a mirror in front of you. You don't have to uh, do anything, it's passive. And then we present you with a rest period or with a blank period or a fixation period, doesn't matter how we call it, which is again between four and 12 seconds immediately afterwards. And then another clip, which is different, and then another uh, rest and so on and so on. In that way, we can show you scores of movie clips. Now see what happens. We are going to measure later. We are measuring the activity of the brain here and here and here and here and here throughout. Later on, we will measure the memory of episode one, of episode two, of episode N, and so on and so on and so on. But since we have these periods here in which you don't see, you don't attend the movie, we can take the activity here to predict the memory later on regarding either this movie, which is before, or either this movie, which is after, which is this activity comes after this movie or before this movie, okay? So in doing these intercalated presentations, movie clip, rest, movie clip, rest, movie clip, or scramble, this is a control, we don't have to go into it, then you can measure activity in the brain here throughout, but later on, when you ask questions about this movie or this movie or this movie and so on and so on, you can also determine what was the activity before this movie or after this movie. So this very simple trick allows you to uh, do your memory retrieval test. You can do it either in the office or you can do it also if you're interested in activity in retrieval, you do it again in a scanner, it doesn't matter for us. And you measure the memory performance. You also measure confidence. We don't have to go into it. So here is a simple movie. This is example of a movie. It's narrative. It's a narrative movie, but it's we have uh, hundreds like that. It's a narrative movie. It in eight seconds, not a lot of things will happen. We are interested in the gist of the movie. Uh, Yosef, Menachem, and other people here who might understand Hebrew. Uh, uh, please, uh, and the other ones, it's eight seconds. It's, it's very simple. Okay, that's a movie. Okay, and the movie is a conversation between three individuals, uh, the mother and the father in this case. Not all the movies are like that. 
they uh, tell their son, uh, you know that we always wanted a daughter. And uh, uh, you came uh, a male. We always wanted a female. We became a male. It's not exactly the same thing. So the, that's not typical Israeli movie. It's just a segment of uh, the narrative occurrence. So people are then, and there are, there are, we have hundreds like that, very short. We have them from four to 16 seconds. And you're going to be asked questions about this movie uh, later on in the test in the subsequent memory. Now I'm going to show you, and that's the most technical thing. It's not technical. I'm not going to go into technicalities, but I want you to see how it looks like uh, in, of course, in, in cartoon, in, in almost cartoons, uh, how the brain looks like and how do we see the data in a very simplified way uh, when we do this experiment. And then I'll summarize that. So don't be alarmed. You don't have to remember the data that I'm showing you. So reminder of the first part of the protocol, we show you a movie and then you don't remember, you, you observe nothing and then a movie and then you observe nothing and then another movie and so on and so on. And I think one session is 40 movies. So this is, active, this is pictures of the brain, of slices of the brain. Of course, the brain is not sliced. It's just that in the scanner, the, the brain looks like a slice. The brain doesn't have colors. These are false colors. We just use them in order to have a grading of activity in parts of the brain. And this is very low resolution here. So for example, uh, in this case, yellow is much stronger than red and gray is not, not active at all. And these are, these kind of graphs are graphs of the change in the signal at the various, er at, the, uh, at the selected areas over time. And time here is in seconds. In fact, it's multiplication of seconds, but it doesn't matter. So now when we search, this is recording when you, this is recording when you learn the information, when you observe the movie. This performance here, remembered or forgotten as you remember, is much, much later, okay? In this case, it's not much, much later, it's 20 minutes later. So now we go back and we draw the activity when you, in those cases in which you remembered, which is red here, in those cases in which you didn't remember, and there is a difference in the activity. This means that these areas here, the names are not important, are playing a role in making you remember before the clip starts, because it's minus seconds, minus seconds, minus seconds, the clip itself starts here. The movie starts here. This is activity here, this is activity in this period before the movie starts, okay? So you identify in that way a number of errors in the brain that are important as predicts or predictors, or if you wish in simpler words, are parts of the brain that take, take part in creating a memory, although the event itself has not yet been presented to you before you, you experience, okay? It's not premonition, by the way. It's a real activity of the brain. We can explain why it is here, but not here, not in this uh, uh, presentation now. But the brain, some parts, limited parts of the brain, a set, a small set of parts of the brain is important to predict memory, is important in creating memory later. So if this is active, before you experience your experience, you will remember. And here is another example. Red is remembered and blue is forgotten. Let's see what happens later, after the experience. So immediate post-stimulus, post-event information, a activity, again, in a very small part, a, a, very, a very small set of regions in the brain, predicts memory as well, which means these areas here, I'll mention only one because even People who are not in the field may recall this one. This is the most important, I hate to say that, but this is the most important part in the brain for you, episodic personal memory. Here, this one here. Uh, activity in these areas is important after the experience. <coughs> this area is called the hippocampus. This is the clip. This is what happens after the experience. If this is active, you will remember much better 
then it, this is not active enough. So forget about the clip itself. This is the after effect of the experience. And you see that this area here, which is called the hippocampus, is important after you experience the event for your memory to be formed. By the way, if you just forget a minute about uh, this data or this presentation, people who are damaged in their hippocampus become amnesics. They do not remember. And of course, there is a spectrum of damage and uh, inability to recall. And in some cases, they become global amnesics. They cannot remember nothing from years before the damage has occurred. And also in dementia, this is the part of the brain, the area, this part of the brain, that is the most important one in expressing, if it's damaged, the damage in dementia. Okay, but dementia is not amnesia because it, con it includes also some other uh, uh, pathologies in brain. But if you, lo and behold, the person is damaged here because of some uh, operation or lesion or disease or viral disease, memory is strongly affected. And you can show that this activity here is indeed a function of the length of the clip. It starts immediately when the clip ends. So the question is, do we remember the isolated clip? So do we remember, do we remember a sort of sliding average? And instead of going into the details, I'll just say we can model the activity of the brain that we see. And we know from the model what we expect to see in case we are remembering consecutive clips, which is single events one after the other, or in case the events are all remembered as a single unit. And what we find is that the brain slices the events every few seconds. When the event comes to a certain point, on which I'll say a, a word in a minute, the brain encodes that event and then starts another event. Okay? So it's sort of slicing time event by event. It's not a rolling, it's not a rolling average. It's taking events that you experience and slicing them and deciding which event is important for registration. What is the meaning of that? What is the meaning of this slicing? We can show, and this is was shown also by others, that the reason the brain decides that the clip now has to be construed and obtain some meaning is that there is what we call event boundary here. One event goes into another, they are different. Now, instead of using this terminology, I'll give you a very simple example. We know from experience that if there is surprise, we remember things better. In fact, this is the basic rule in uh, memory research. Surprise is a driver, is an engine of memory formation. If things are routine, we become habituated and don't remember well, the details. If we have one clip and then we have another clip which is very different, there is surprise in the brain because the clip, the first clip, sort of predicts that the clip will continue. But now we stop here. So in this area here, in this time point here, the brain was expecting something that that clip will continue. <clears throat> but there is a surprise, there is discontinuation, there is event boundary here. And that event boundary causes the brain to consider whether this clip here was good enough, was important enough to be registered or not, and then it goes on to the other clip. So in our brain, there are slices of time, and the slices are determined by the surprise transformation from one event to the other. If the event continues, becomes boring, like probably that talk for some of you, you discontinue registration of memory. But if you surprise, then if you surprise, if you have a surprise or you surprise the audience or the subjects, they will remember better each event. And this is why Haydn had he, this uh, a, a, a change of mind uh, in the surprise symphony. And of course it happens in real life and it happens, uh, politicians use it a lot. The last data point, the last data point, don't be, uh, uh, alarmed by these graphs, all they say is the following. We can show that 
the activity of the brain when it's online, when the, when, uh, sorry, when the information is online, when you observe the, the movie, the small clip, is mostly based on retrieval and comparison. You retrieve information from the past to, to tell the brain where well, this is new. An activity immediately when the clip, the information uh, terminates, when there is a boundary to the event, is mostly encoding of things new. So the brain switches from one state to another, from a retrieval state to encoding state and back retrieval state, encoding state. In other words, when you experience things in life in real time, you the circuit in your brain that is important for memory switches all the time, throughout, continuously, between recalling the past, experience the present, and considering that it's good enough for the future. It's not a static machine. It's not a machine that does only one thing. There is a switch all the time, which is very briefly, a, a very brief uh, elements of, uh, uh, of information. And this is the event boundary. So altogether, as scientists, we like to have uh, models, and uh, the model is much simpler than it uh, pretends to be. This is the experience. This is the time. This is time. Okay. This is time. This is the experience. For those of you who are interested in the brain, this is called the medial temporal lobe. That's the area of the brain containing the hippocampus, which is exploded for being able to experience and to record the experience. Information before the experience will influence whether that experience will go into memory. I showed you one example just as illustration. During the experience, your brain or that part of the brain is important for memory switches rapidly between retrieval and encoding, retrieval and encoding, retrieval and encoding. Your brain is a comparator, a comparator that works throughout time, and the slices here are fractions of a second, but it's not yet the present time for your perceptual moment because you have to continue retrieval and encoding, retrieval and encoding for comparison to decide whether this will be considered as, as, as one unit in time. After that, the information goes into a consolidation state. It's not important for us now. This occurs when there is an event boundary. Forget about the other things because they go into longer term memory. So experience here is a few seconds. It breaks down this system breaks down after about 16 to 20 seconds. So for a single event to be recorded as present moment in cognitive terms, it has to be anywhere between four seconds and 16 to 20 seconds. It's a few seconds. And if you think about it, not as a scientist, but as a human being experiencing on present time, this makes sense. <clears throat> because when you think about what you do now, it's usually in terminology, in, 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 a, a, in, in a, a time scale of seconds. But these seconds break down into very rapid alterations between retrieval, alternations between retrieval and encoding, retrieval and encoding. So this time itself is broken down into subtimes or subunits, but the experience itself requires the integration of them over a few seconds. What happens later, just to give you an idea, is something which is very important. It was an episode, an episode which was a narrative, vivid, with details, contextual. You can reenact it. You can reenact it, retrieve it, re reactivate it. You can uh, judge its correctness later. I just used here a very nice uh, painting by Lin. Um, and, uh, it's a, I think the magic teller. And uh, what happens over, and this is called episodic, and we know what parts of the brain are important. So acquiring this is a few seconds, this is present time, but it will remain like that with the ability to remember vivid details and narratives and so on and so on for days and weeks, in some cases, even up to months. But later on, Almost all information in your brain, all the information that was here for a few seconds will be converted into a semantic form, not episodic anymore, with poor context, with only the gist, as you remember, flat in details, not vivid, verbal, and, uh, and uh, you still uh, are able to say whether it's correct or not. 
So memory is transformed over time. It starts with the present time. It's converted into memory by what happened before and what happened after within a few seconds, but it can be retained for weeks, months, and years, but it's not the same memory. In most cases, it becomes semantic, like a text in a book. And then the issue of whether it's series A or series B comes into, account, comes into consideration, because here you usually remember what was before, what was after, what was here, but you don't really uh, endow some privilege to time present here because it was in the past. The privilege time present here is here. This was before, this is after, it's still uh, <clears throat> very different. When it becomes semantic, you may remember that A, that X, X occurred before Y, but you don't really deal with them as though they are different, they are flat on your memory curve. So what's my take on message after trying to give you a glimpse into the way people study these kind of moments in brain. Remember, those are cognitive moments, moments that are neuronal moments or present in neuronal language is shorter. Moments that are social moments are longer, but cognitive moments are this type of uh, time scale. So what's the take home message? A, the state of a brain before, during, and after an event determines whether a memory will be formed. So the state of the brain before the present, during the present, and after the present determines whether the memory will be formed. It's not only the present time that is encoded in your brain as a memory. Experiences unfold on the fly for a few seconds. This is the order of magnitude of time present in cognitive uh, brain research. Till they make sense. They have to make sense, it's anthropomorphism. It's not that the brain really intends to make sense. What we are saying is that the computations in the brain find out whether it makes sense for us before the brain takes the decision. Again, anthropomorphism, but we can use that whether to register the information or not. The decision is taken at event boundaries, or if you wish to use other terminology, the decision is taken when there is a surprise uh, uh, occurrence in the event. No surprises, very little memory. Surprises do not have to be really big surprises. In the process, the brain alternates within fractions of a second. So I told you here, those are seconds. But within fraction of a second, within this one, there is a reduction here. Uh, between, there is alternation between retrieval and encoding, comparing old with new, rapidly alternating the reactivated past with the experienced present. We do it all the time. We don't have a pure present. In our present, we always use the past. Present time, in real life, experienced episode is in the second range, which are multiple perceptual moments, because perceptual moments, if you remember from the beginning, even there we said they're much briefer, they're fractions of a second. And it's encoding into memory is not a faithful replication of reality. This emerges from here, because it's not the present time only that determines when memory will occur. It's something that happens before and something that happens after. So what you encode is not what happens in time present. It's not a replication of the representation there because you introduced, we used to say you contaminate, but the terminology in science is different than from real life. You contaminate the present from with the past and the future, the close future, the immediate future. So when you, Present time in real life experience episode, which is the basis for our individual memory, is it the second range composed of perceptual moments, but it's encoding into memory a priori is not a faithful replication of reality, which leads us to the last. The seeds of inaccuracy of our episodic memory are embedded in the algorithms in the steps taken by the brain of the system from the outset. The brain in bits is built in such a way that when you remember things that you are experiencing now in the present, they will not be accurate in your memory. 
Therefore, if I will now test the people here, I don't know, I don't see exactly how many, let's say 25 people here, over 20 individuals here, for their memory of a certain event that occurred during this talk, even though all of them might have excellent memory, and all of them, none of them fell asleep, which is uh, probably uh, not the case usually in seminars, then even though you all observe the same thing, you all attended the same information, and you all were vigilant and attentive and uh, awake, and you wanted to remember, your memories when tested later will not be the same, not because your memory is faulty, because in your brain, information before the present, immediately before the present, and immediately after the present time, will determine what will be the representation of the memory, of the episodic memory, and therefore, inaccuracy of uh, uh, memory is not a problem in memory. It's built in the system to start with. Thank you very much.